now I wanted to introduce Professor Michelle Lum from biology to introduce our speaker for tonight. Michelle. So I am very pleased and honored to present the speaker of tonight's um, faculty pub night, my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Martina Ramirez, professor of biology. Um, I'm going to, uh, Martina's work, particularly with regards to research with undergrads, um, has been an inspiration to all of us in the biology department, and kind of something I'm going to emphasize in my introduction of her. Um, it's something that's inspired us in biology, and I think should be an inspiration to all of us here at LMU. Martina actually has a long history at LMU. Um, she is an LMU alum, and she graduated with her BS in biology in 1981. Um, she then obtained her PhD in biology at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, after that, she taught at a number of universities, including Pomona College, Bucknell University, Denison University before coming full circle and returning back to LMU and the biology department as a faculty member now. Um, again, I really want to emphasize Mar um, Martina's work with undergrads because it is such a central part of what she does here at LMU and her research, which she will be telling you about. Uh, Martita has um, a long history of fostering and promoting undergraduate research. She's been a biology counselor for the Council of Undergraduate Research. She was on the board of directors for many years for the Southern California Conference of Undergraduate Research, which hosts a conference that we send many of our students to events at each year. Martina is currently the director of undergraduate research here at LMU. Uh, Martina has been involved in a number of major grants that have been awarded which have given opportunities to undergraduates to do research here at LMU, including grants from the National Science Foundation, the W.W. Keck Foundation, Merck AAAS, and Light Corps Biosciences. She received the Regenica Award for Student Faculty Research from the LMU Seaver College of Science and Engineering in 2012. In 2013, she was recipient of the Research Mentor Award from the Council of Undergraduate Research. Martinez's research involves spiders, as you can see. Um, and her work spans many, but her work spans many areas. She does conservation, genetics, reproductive biology, and environmental toxicology. Some of these things we'll, we'll hear about. Um, Martina not only engages many students at undergraduate um, so research, sometimes as many twenty in any given semester, but she does this very successfully. And this work takes place primarily in what students very affectionately refer to as the spider lab which is located on the first floor of Seaver and will be moving to the third floor of the New Life Science Building. And this is where you will find Martina and an army of undergraduates engaged in research on spiders if they're not out in the field collecting spiders. And even students who do not like spiders often you know, join her lab and they learn to um, not necessarily collect them, but to research them. Mm. Uh, so in a field where research labs are generally run by a faculty member and composed of PhD students and postdocs, um, to so effectively carry out research with only undergraduates has been quite an accomplishment. Of the 15 papers she's published since 1995, 11 of those have had undergraduate co-authors. Well over 23 of our undergraduates have been um, published. So to so effectively carry research um, with undergraduates is quite an accomplishment, a testament to Martina's commitment to undergraduate research and to carrying out the mission of this university. I would say that she is effectively carrying out the goals she stated, which are to seek out new science concerning the diversity of spiders and to foster the success of LMU undergraduates, especially women and men members of underrepresented groups. So tonight, Martina will be telling us a story that she has published about spiders and that has come out of her work with many, many LMU undergraduates. And with that, let me introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Martina Ramirez, who will be telling us about the sex life of spiders or Adventures in Spider Sexual Biology. Thank you. Well, thanks everyone for coming out during a busy time of year. I always wonder who wants to hear about spider sex on a busy afternoon in spring. In any case, we'll try to give you kind of a nice story. What I'm going to do is talk about sort of some fundamentals that lead to the things you're going to hear about. This is going to be a talk about science, and it's really, science in my view is one of these investigative sorts of things. I always tell people that good science is very much like a good detective story, okay? So whodunit novels and things like that, you know, detectives at work sleuthing as very much kind of like what we do, okay? So in any case, let's begin here. Hopefully this technology works. As Michelle talked about, my lab really has two goals, and I touched on this when uh, I was promoted to full professor.
tracks are one of the traditions in the Seaver College is you do these professorial talks. And as it says here, the goal of the lab, and this pointer doesn't work apparently, but is to seek out new science concerning the diversity of spiders and foster the success of healthy uterus, especially women and members of underrepresented groups. What, I do, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about both tonight. We're going to mostly spend time talking about the science, but I'm going to come back kind of near the end to talk about sort of the second goal. In any case, let's talk about my experience here briefly, because it'll give you some idea of where this came from. I was here from 77 to 81. So this is the oldest faculty group picture I could find for the Seaver faculty. This is 1985. It didn't really look much different to when I was here, 77 to 81. If you look at the crowd, you'll notice that there are very few women. There's only three, from what I can tell. And ethnic diversity is not a whole lot here. Okay. But when I was here, there was big distinction between the way the student body looked and the way the faculty looked. Right. Okay. But I could see over the four years that I was here, there was actually some attrition, right? So four years later, walking across the stage, there were fewer of both groups in my graduating class as a biology major than there were when I started. And this problem of STEM, you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, diversity issues with women and underrepresented students have been kind of a big issue historically. We've come a long way since 81, but there's still work to do. So having, having been a person who was adopted in nine months, grew up poor, first in my family to go to college, an underrepresented minority myself, right? These issues kind of mattered a lot to me, right? But I didn't see that these things were going to change unless some of us under, you know, undergraduates might think about coming back here to start becoming players in the system as faculty members to try to work ourselves to diversify the STEM world. And that's kind of been my basic goal for forever, essentially, as a professional. So what's my strategy to do this? It's been to do pretty much kind of what I did. So my goal is to take students from entering freshman year, run them through a series of experiences that have them working in the summer and in the academic year, doing research, taking the appropriate courses, lower division and upper division. They learn a whole bunch of things by being in research groups. There's a whole variety of skill sets they get to develop. Right? Okay. One of the things I had along the way as a job before I started this faculty career is I worked for several months in the uh, graduate admissions office at UC Santa Cruz between getting my PhD and my actually got a first faculty job at Pomona College. So I was processing incoming applications, right? And I was trying to look at what folders were getting a lot of attention from faculty. It was pretty clear that students that had serious skills development had done these sorts of things, right? So it was kind of my goal as a professional to run students through this whole story so at the end, they could be these folks at the end who have good GPA, good GRE, and they do really well in the graduate admissions and they get fellowships and so forth. So in addition to having my career focused on doing good science with spiders, the other goal has really been to use that as an experience, as a vehicle to um, one by one produce students that are going to change the diversity of STEM. Okay. And you'll sort of see elements of this as we go through the talk. We'll come back to this again and take a look kind of exclusively with students. Okay. In any case, to our issue at hand. As Michelle talked about, the lab has three goals. I'm only going to talk about really something in this middle one, which is reproductive biology, because it's one sort of most accessible to people. But uh, we work in all three areas. Okay. So in any case, without further ado, let's begin. All right. You're going to talk sex. You need to know hard work. Okay. <laughs> so here's a spider that's cut through the body. You can see for our purposes that the ovaries are here. This is a female. There's an opening to the bottom. Remember, this is kind of like the abdomen, the belly of the critter, let's say, in the back where a lot of the organs are. Okay, and let's take a look at what's in there kind of in more detail. So there's two ovaries. The plumbing basically takes you to a vaginal opening in the center. And you notice these two things that look like Boda bags up there. They're seminal receptacles. That's where sperm is deposited. You can put sperm from one male or several males in those bags. Fertilization only happens when little eggs are meandering down the oviduct. When they pass by those Boda bags, you'll notice that there's this little shunt. Right. Only when these eggs are flying by is sperm actually taken out of those little bags and actually do they meet the egg coming down. Okay. So in any case, you're going to notice there are separate openings on the outside to put sperm in, and there's a separate opening to have eggs go out. So what does this look like when you get to the outside? Well, actually, let's take a look at the male. The male essentially has kind of like the same game plan. You notice there are these two testes here. You have plumbing, and eventually takes you to a single opening. Once again, if you look on the bottom of the body here in the back, there's again a single opening down there. Okay. Now let's continue this because if you look at the outside of the animal, this is what you see. 
Females have this sort of little area here that's pretty obviously a different color called the epigenum. We'll take a look at that in a little bit. The males don't have that kind of thing, but in any case, they're going to have openings for their, their reproductive materials on the bottom of their body. So what do we have here? Let's examine this in some detail. Here's that little area called the epigenum that we talked about a little while ago. We're going to blow this up and take a look at it in a bit. The male doesn't have that kind of thing, but he has this little slit where reproductive products can come out. The female kind of has a slit kind of to do the same thing. Okay, so let's take a look at the female kind of in detail. If you look at that structure called the epigenum, it kind of looks like a saddle for a horse. It has this center thing called the scape. If you look on the left and right hand side of the scape, those are the openings to those two sperm bags we showed you. Okay? Okay? So in any case, just keep that in mind. Because essentially, there's two openings where males are going to have to deposit their sperm stuff. Okay? And what makes a male a male? Well, here's kind of one of the obvious things. If you look at males, they have these sort of little leg-like things up in front. But in, in males and females, they both have these. Let's jump back and show you. You notice females have these little short leg-like things. Males have them, but they're a sort of a different shape in males. All right, so what happens is this. In males, they become enlarged into these big boxing glove-like things. And if you enlarge this, what you get is this complicated structure. The thing is, this is in fact where sperm is carried in this sort of plumbing stuff. Okay? Sperm is actually put out through this little fine tube that is called the embolus. So when sex <coughs> happens, what males have to do is stick that little, that little tube, that embolus thing, into those two openings you saw that lead to the, essentially the sperm storage sites in females. Okay? Now, well remember, you saw on the bottom of the body, that's where sperm is going to be put out. But the structures that carry the sperm are up in front. So how does the male manage this? Well, what he does is the following. He builds this thing called a sperm web, and then he ejaculates onto the sperm web itself. So you'll see this sort of little bubble of sperm sitting here. Now what he does is he comes over with his palps and he charges them up. So it's kind of like he's going to the gas station, filling his tanks. When he's tanked up, he's ready for action. So what happens next? You're ready to go mate. Okay. If you're a hunting spider, you do mating dances. Okay, they're really pretty complicated. Visual spiders. It's kind of all in the dance you do, how you look. You have to look cool and stuff like that. <laughs> the ones that are doing the displaying are the males. The females here are simply being the evaluators of the dance quality of whoever's trying to do things with them. If you're a web building spider where vision is not so good, it's kind of all in the vibrations because here's a big female spider. She's in her web, and here's a male who's coming along strumming her web. Okay? Different spiders have different patterns of strumming of the, of the web, even in different species. Remember, spiders that build webs are essentially blind, so they don't really know who's around them. All they know is the vibration story that's coming in. The male has to convince her that he's a male and not food. Right? Then he has to send her, because that's bad. You don't want to get shot off. Okay? But then he also has to tell her that he's the right species, because quite often you have different species living in the same area. So depending on the vibration pattern, she'll know that he's the right and is not the wrong kind. If he's the wrong kind, you're toast. You're dead, basically. Right? So you have to be careful about this business. Okay? Now, there are, in fact, mating positions. How do spiders have sex? There's about seven or eight mating positions. They vary by family. People that take my biology spiders class have to learn the mating positions for the different families for exams and stuff like that. People sort of get weirded out during finals week. You're doing what? <laughs> the spiders have mating positions? Yes, they do. Okay. What does this look like in real life? Here's an example. Here's tarantulas mating. <gasps> okay. okay. X-rated activities on screen there. <laughs> okay. So in any case, like I said, this really happens. Now, let's move on and talk about this. How often does making love happen? Right? Well, it depends. Some females mate once in life, and that's it. Some females mate with multiple partners. Right? Something about this business as an apparent defense against paternity competition. In other words, if you're male number one who gets in and does something with a female, you don't really want to have somebody else show up and put their sperm also in that same sperm bag. So one thing you notice that there are structures like chastity belts, which we'll show you a picture here shortly, that apparently appear in those openings to basically plug them up and stop competitors. Okay? Mating plugs can be of two kinds. We're going to look at both kinds. One is resinous, the other is broken off male stuff. Okay? What does this look like? Let's take a picture. When you look into those two openings, remember that are leading to those sperm bags, you're supposed to see basically these like caves, right? 
But you notice on one side, there's stuff plugging the opening, right? That's this resinous material that we talked about. It reminds you just kind of like putty. Putty appears in the opening, and it's blocked. Okay? When male structures break off, this is what you get. This clearly was part of his palpal structure, that device that he's going to use to transfer sperm. Some of this broke off. kind of reminds you of fragments of furniture or something just stuck in the opening. Right? This is another way that people thought, oh, maybe this is the way for males to try to assure their fraternity. Okay? Now, who makes this material, these, these plugs? Well, let's talk about resinous plugs here. Some are formed by males only. Some, interestingly, are formed by males and females. People have done chemistry on this stuff, and find, they found that if the female doesn't put in your component, the plug stuff the male puts in falls out. Apparently, this is a way for females after sex to figure out, well, what did I really think of that experience? <laughs> <laughs> okay. And if you're not into it, you just don't have your component, and the male thing falls out, and you're good to go to have sex again. Kind of cool. Okay. I don't know of any examples where female-only material makes it, but the point is, to figure this stuff out, you have to have a whole variety of scientific processes. Not all of this has been done for our very few species in the world that we know these details for. Okay. Now, here's some other things that have been suggested for this business. In, in addition to the business of sperm competition, trying to assure your fraternity, some other things have been suggested, which at least Bob to, which is, remember, those pipes that we had there that leads to those sperm bags, they're open to the air. So one thought is that you might be trying to defend yourself against disease, right? Who's to say the bacteria might not float in through the air into those, those holes? But the other thing is you might want to keep the things that are in there, your eggs or the ovaries, from drying out, right? Some people say there's actually more purposes to these plug things than just trying to do fraternity defense, okay? Now, let's take this on the road to a real world example a really cool spider. You can find these even on campus. This is the green lynx spider, Puecia viridens. This is a very common hunting spider in Southern California. They're really beautiful. They're on bushes pretty commonly in the fall. If you go to Han Regional Park, you know, a couple miles from campus, there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of these things over there. There used to be some on the bluff at LMU. That's a female on the left, a male on the right. And you notice the male has those little enlarged things that look like boxing gloves. We're going to look at those up close. Okay. These are hunting spiders. They lurk in the plants. The poor little bees and bugs are coming in, minding their own business, and then all of a sudden, ah, I'm going to take you down, right? So there's a wasp that's been killed by a female. And again, you're doing this whole business of chowing down as a female because you want to produce that object called an egg sac. Okay. The egg sacs are going to feature prominently in our story kind of a little bit. Okay, now our story with this business, reproductive biology in this species, begins with this person, Alan Grady. He was at Hope College in Michigan, right, okay, for a long time. He published this book, his paper in 1964, and here's what he said. He said, he, when he examined these females, and he looked at the females of Tigenum, that area on the bottom of the body, he often found that those openings that we told you about that lead to the sperm bags, he found that they were often plugged with hard black stuff, right? And he sometimes found that parts of the male's reproductive structure, his palp, this thing called the parasymbium, he found that this was often stuck in, those in that plug material as well. Let's take a look at pictures of this to see what it's like. <coughs> so here's the way a female should look without mating plugs. Again, there's two cave entrances. If you're a little tiny person, we shrunk you down, you could walk in there like a spelunker into the cave. Eventually, you should reach the ovaries back there, right? But here's what Brady saw quite often, which was this. Instead of a cave you can walk into, there's brown goo stuck in there. Okay? And the other thing he saw sometimes is this. There's the male's reproductive structure. There's his palp that's enlarged. There are these barred things sticking off the side, which is known as the parasymbium. Okay? So here's what he sometimes discovered, which is this. Here's an opening that's totally open, or at least partly open. And here's an opening in a female. But you've got some goo material, but then you've got the bar stuck in there. Where did the bar came from? It broke off the male during sex. Right? It's like, whoa, this is different. <laughs> okay. You lose things when you're having <laughs> sex. Sometimes. <laughs> We're going to see how often this happens. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be one of our mysteries. Okay. Now, here's what happens. Remember that there are two of these. Okay. So here's what Brady says. He says in 1964, the plug into the female epigenum, right, sealing up those openings, and the loss of the male parasympium, should prevent further mating by both males and females. In other words, mate once in life and you're done. That's it. Okay. 
Now he said, actually, if you think about it, a male could potentially mate with two females because remember, he has two palpi. So he could like lose one bar and one female as long as he only used one palp and he could lose the second one and the second female. Okay, so in any case, but the point is, it was limited mating opportunities for both, is the idea. Okay. Now what happens next is a year later, this paper comes out by Whitcomb and East and some people at the University of Arkansas. And what they did is they took high-speed video recordings of the mating dance. Or actually, it's a mating interesting thing. How many people like gymnastics? How many people like the Olympics? How many people like um, high wire? High wire acts in Vegas? OK, these spiders make dangling in the air. They jump. So they're both going to be lurking on a branch of a plant. The female goes over and dangles on the thread. And then the male follows her down. And while they're dangling there, sexual activities happen. Right? Pretty nifty. I don't know too many spiders in the world that do it hanging in the open. So the point is, they did high-speed video, then they slowed it down. So here's what they found about this story, which is this. When they looked at the images, they saw that the male is doing numerous copulations. In other words, he's sticking his male palps over and over again into those openings on the left and right of the female. Right? Okay. And the other thing is they had several males in their study, and they allowed those males, in some cases, to mate with other female partners. And one of the males in their study mated with up to three females over three different days. In their study, the females that they saw basically mated only once, and that was it. Okay. So if you think about it, there are some mysteries here. And here are the two mysteries. They're pretty simple. Okay. One is, what role does the parasymbion play? Because keep in mind, the parasymbion, according to Brady, was this orientation device. Why have those bars hanging off on the palp? Because apparently it was supposed to help you get your angle correctly so you could stick your embolus into those sperm, the opening into the sperm bag. Okay. So he says if you, if you lose both of those palpi, right, it should stop you from having repeated copulations by males. Right? But what kind of eason? basically suggests the presence of parasympathy may not be absolutely necessary for copulation because in their video, the males are putting those palps over and over again into the same female, plus they're mating with several females if you give them chances to over different days, right? Okay. Now the thing about Whitcomb and Easton, which is going to be kind of important later on, is this. Notice, they did not report on the production of live young by their mated females. In other words, who's to say that the video images that they were recording, that all those insertions were actually resulting in sperm transfer? The gold standard is you actually have a female that's going to produce live babies. And they never actually told you that in the sperm. Right? The other question which emerges out of this stuff is this. How often are mating clubs produced? Well, here's kind of the two papers that lead in, into this story. One is that Whitcomb and Easton, the people that did the videos, they found plugs in all the females they examined. Right? But in that same year, this other set, this other paper, which actually includes Whitcomb notes, again, in the same authorship there, they found that all their mated females had plugs, right? And the numbers they kind of give you are this, something like 20 mated females, 10 had, law, 10 had at least one male parasymbium embedded in the plug. Among the other 10, the plug was either missing altogether or contained either parasymbium. So you get this sort of sense that in the second study, some females had it, some females did, right? No. Their language in this paper is kind of confusing. So I'd really rather tell them five of them had this, right? Three of them had that. And somehow they have this convoluted sense. But the point is, you get the sense that apparently half their sample did not have plugs necessarily, or those male things stuck in. Okay, so these mysteries in the literature had sat there for essentially 1965 until we showed up. So our goal, the students and I, was to resolve these mating mysteries. And let's take a look at the students who did it. Sarah, Sarah Iman on the left, Melissa Wachowski on the right, Sarah is a vet, Melissa is now a, a lawyer. Okay. A year later, this other crowd came along, class of 2008. Okay, the students that you see here, Catherine, Catherine, Angie, Rachel, and Lauren, they've all gone to medical school or graduate school since then. Kind of cool. Okay. So here's what they did. The goal here was to think about how this stuff would work. So here's what we did. When Sarah and Melissa were in the lab, they spent summer of 2004 collecting juvenile green spiders. They brought them into the lab. So we know they're virginal because we're going to raise them from juvenilehood to adulthood. And then here's what they do. Notice there are 21 females and 7 males. What they're going to do is they're going to allow each male to mate with three randomly chosen females. You're going to leave them together for 24 hours. They're going to come in the next day. 
It's kind of like they're in a little hotel room overnight. You show up <laughs> next door. You're, you're the people in white lab coats. Hello, we're going to do a gynecological te you know, check on you and stuff like that. Okay, and you inspect the females to see do they have plugs and do they have male parasymbia broken off. And you check the male's palps to see does he have or not have the bars, the parasymbium, on the left and right palp. So what does it look like to do this? Well, it's entertaining. Okay. First of all, you have to have the mating chamber or the love nest. Okay. <laughs> and the game plan is this. You can see there's a female parked in the love nest. Okay. What you do is this. The spiders have been reared in these containers in the back. What you have to do is set them up into the love nest that Cynthia here is doing. She helped out the students you saw. Okay. You put a female on a dress, beautiful plant that's a, <laughs> actually a buckwheat plant from campus. You let her get accommodated to the space. And then you introduce the male. So you notice we've got two love nests running here. The containers in blue house males of different numbers, ID numbers. So what you do is after she's been in there for a while, you take, in this case, male number one, drop him in there. You take male number five, drop him in there. And then you go away for 24 hours. You leave it in the lab. We'll be back tomorrow. Have fun. <laughs> Bye. Okay. All right. And then you come in the next day. And hello, you check on how they did. Okay, so what you have to do is take the individual male and female, plunk them under a scope, get them under high magnification, and that's the male. You're trying to see for each of his little palp-like, you know, his boxing glove-like things, do you see the bar there on the left or the right one? Okay, and this is interesting to kind of do, and actually here's kind of how it is. There's a lot of numbers here, but the point is actually very simple. Let me show you an example. So notice we have seven males, males numbered one to seven. And here's the results of the gynecological exams for both males and females. And it's actually pretty simple. So let's take a look at, at number one. If you look at number one, what they're showing you is plug in the epigenum. You notice left and right. Those two openings on the left and right that lead to the sperm bags, we'll notice. If you have an N there, it means that there is no plug material of any sort in the left and right. When you see a little P, that means that a parasymbium from a male broke off. So that female had a parasymbium on the right-hand side. And notice, the male himself, he lost his right palp, or the right parasymbium, right? Well, where did it go? It went into her corresponding side, OK? And was the female fertile? Did this sexual activity that they did result in live babies? You can see it, yes, the answer is yes, OK? Now, we're not going to go through some detail, but I just want to show you, though, if you look at the number of N's, you'll notice there are C's, which means they're a complete plug. you notice there are some things here that are listed as PR. That's when you get a pile of goo, but it's not big enough to seal the opening. So we're getting everything here from no plug at all, complete plugs, and then plugs that are kind of there, but they're not big enough to seal the opening. And you'll notice also, Sometimes you get male structures in both sides. So notice this male here loses left and right, and they go into the female. And the female also has complete plugs. But then you notice in other cases, uh, I think number four is a good one. Here's an interesting one. The male lost his left and right parasymbium, but they didn't go into the female. Where did they go? They fell on the bottom of the chamber. So sometimes when this happens, stuff doesn't work apparently the way it's supposed to. Okay? And what you're going to notice here is, if you look at the number of yeses in the table, notice the number of yeses. There's a lot of yeses, right? which means most of these sexual activities turned out to give you live babies. Right? But something to keep in mind about this is the following. Notice, this male lost his left and right parasymbium with, with this female, his first one. Remember, when he's mating with female number two and female number three, he doesn't have those orientation structures in place. Well, yet, she produced live babies, and she did too. Right? So notice, the take-home message of this little laboratory-based thing is pretty, pretty cool. 21 females involved in mating, 17 later spun egg sacs in which live spiderlings emerged. And of those 17, 12 were second and third in the mating sequence. Right? The cool thing, which I just alluded to, is this. Of those 12 females that were second and third, nine were inseminated by males that lost their parasymbium the first time out. Right? Okay. So the point is, the presence of this palpable structure, this parasymbium thing, is apparently not successful. It's not essential for successful insemination, right? unlike what Brady said. Okay. Now, the other thing that they did is they took this into the wild. They said, OK, we've shown in the lab this, this plug's production is pretty, inf you know, it happens sometimes, it happens other, t other times it doesn't. The male thing sometimes breaks off, sometimes it doesn't. But then they said, let's go out into the wild. And what they did is the following. 
They went out into the wild to find females that were sitting with live eggs or actually sitting on eggs, right? So they, we know they mated with someone. They're going to do exactly the same thing. Bring them into the lab, do gynecological exams in those females to find out what's their plug and parasymbial configuration. So in any case, 54 animals collected in November, as you see, October, November 2004. And they're going to do essentially the same thing they did with those females in the lab. So in any case, let's take a look at this. There's Lauren looking around. This is actually near the Native American Memorial out on the bluff. You can see there's the buckwheat plants there. And they're pretty obvious when they're on the plants, but they're sitting quite often right on the top of the buckwheat head. And it's pretty simple. You just walk up and take a container, put it around, and you've got your spider. Bring them into the lab and see there's one in her hand, right? Kind of cool, sitting there chilling with the egg sac. Her goal is to defend that to the death. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Okay. But because they have that kind of orientation, it means separating them is no easy task. Here's Catherine trying to separate a female from her egg sac. The spider is now attacking the little artist brush. <laughs> okay. And there she is holding the spider who's <laughs> grabbing the artist brush while she's waving it around. Okay. Getting these spiders to do what you want is kind of an adventure. Okay. Eventually, when they're when they're down, you do the exam. Well, here's what they found. There are 54 spiders, right? Notice the way this table is set up. Here's the epigenal configuration. How many females have two left and right total complete plugs? How many have one complete, two partial, one partial? And here's the parasymbial processes, those male things that break off, right? Do you have uh, both present? Do you have both absent? Do you have one present? Well, take a look at the number over here. 26 of the 54 females had no male structures in them, and they had no plugs. Half your sample is sitting out there having mated, but they don't have plugs at all, and they don't have male structures broke off. Right? You look at the male structures here, the 54 spiders, 39 of 54 spiders had no male structures in them at all. There's other 15 have some combination of one or two. So in any case, take a look at the data. Mating plugs. Okay, among all females, 50%, which we showed you had no plugs at all, the t other 24% had a complete plug in both orifices, and everything else you can imagine is kind of in between. The remainders have combinations of partial and complete plugs. If you look at the parasymbia, 72 of the sample, which is 39 out of 54, remember, has no parasymbium in either orifice, right? Okay. So the bottom line here is these results show that just like in the lab, forming plugs and transferring these parasymbia is not a done deal. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Why? We don't know. Okay. So in any case, the take-home message out of this was the following. Right? First of all, the male structure, that parasymbial thing, remember, as we showed you, many of those females that produced live babies had made it with a male who didn't have those barred things on their pelvis, right? So we say this structure is apparently not required for successful insemination. Its reproductive significance is unclear. The mating plug itself, remember, production is inconsistent when present, its condition was not uniform. And we also saw, as we showed you in that one place, broken off male parasitia are usually found in the females, but not always, because we have that example of where they broke off and apparently fell on the ground instead of into the female. Yeah. Remember, we took on these questions that have been in literature for like 40 years. We show up in the 2000s for these things that appeared in 64 and 65, so in any case. This turned into a nice story. We produced, this is based on the laboratory rearing stuff and the field survey. I think these students did this paper, came out in 2010. And the cool thing is, in the same year, I had been communicating with Gabriel Uhl in Germany. He was pulling together a worldwide review of this whole business of mating plugs, right? If you work in the animal behavior world and spiderdom, this whole business of paternity defense or lack thereof, what have you, is a really hot topic, right? So it got so, to be such a big deal that he decided to survey the spiders of the world and find out how often does this business happen, how is it done, and so forth. Right? So he has this really cool paper. And this table goes on and on and on for several pages. It goes through all the spiders in the world that are known to do this. Right? So the kind of neat thing about our stuff is he gave us like part of two pages in his review where he talks specifically about the research we did here at LMU. Because our spider is unique in that it takes the resinous mating plug material, and it combines it with broken off male parts. There's apparently no other spider in the world that's involved in doing this business, trying to play paternity assurance games by using both things at once, which is why he gave us all this airplay in the review. Okay. Now here's a follow-up, which again involves students, which is this. Later on, Victoria Chirikian on the left, Liz White on the right. Okay, uh, Victoria is in graduate school, Liz is in med school right now. 
they came along, we sit, were sitting around one day in the summer, and we thought, you know, the people who preceded us showed that many of these females in the wild, half the sample of those wild sampled ones, they've mated with someone, but there's nothing blocking their openings to their sperm bags, right? So who's to say if that an interesting, attractive male shows up, that she's not going to decide, hey, let's do stuff, right? Okay, so they took an approach to this, which was pretty cool. What they did is they, put, they did paternity testing of the spider baby. So here's what they did. The game plan for them was to go out into the wild, gather females guarding egg sacs, bring the moms and the egg sacs back, hold the egg sacs in lab until little babies started coming out. When little babies started coming out, you froze the little babies. Now you have mom in the freezer, and you have all her kids. Now you do paternity testing to find out whether those kids had one dad or several dads, and then you see what you find. Okay. Well, this study got published as well because they, in fact, found that although most of the samples they looked at had single paternity, some of them had multiple fathers, pretty clearly. Right. So we've shown now that this system that was supposedly proposed by Brady back in 1964 as being a paternity defense kind of thing, apparently it's a pretty wonky system. If it doesn't work a lot of the time, as you saw in the prior study, and then when you actually look at the genetic evidence, you find out that some of these females are, in fact, getting involved with multiple guys along the way, right? which is why these little babies have multiple fathers. Kind of pretty cool. Okay? Now, let's talk about this experience kind of explicitly. As I said, the second goal for doing this business, you've seen a whole lot of students in these pictures so far. Let's talk about kind of cycle back to that image that I showed you and how you can take a freshman who's coming out of high school into LMU and run them through a four-year set of experiences to produce these students that are going to go out and hopefully become people that are going to diversify STEM. What does it look like to actually do this, live in the spider lab? Sophie Crinian, who is here as part of this tradition, you're going to see her picture coming up shortly. Okay, so life in the spider lab. What does it look like? Well, you go places. We go a whole lot of different places. There's Sophie on Catalina Island with Amanda Ballard. Okay, Sophie did a two-year study of insects and spiders out there. Pretty nifty stuff. They often go collecting locally, like Pond Park, which is just a couple of miles from LMU. People get dirty digging in the ground, getting you know ground-dwelling spiders and stuff like that. Those students up there are in northern LA County. People come up and that's not an LMU student on the right there. <laughs> that was a little girl who was out in her mom. They were walking their dog and they thought, what we were doing was so cool. So she came and helped us look for these trapdoor spiders. She's tagging around. She got really good at it. Pretty nifty, right? So, okay. And then you bring stuff back to the lab. Now, the lab is kind of an interesting place. A lot of stuff goes on there. These students were studying trapdoor spiders. They collected 398 little baby trapdoor spiders to do paternity testing from, and those are out of a single mom. Well, if you're going to do paternity testing, that means each of those babies needs to go in a film canister, or rather a little plastic frisette. So you notice over here, umpteen hundreds of frisettes. Each of those needs to be individually labeled with an ID for all those babies there. So one of the things people in the lab laugh about is that you spend hours and hours, depending on what project you, you work on, labeling things, right? And then you do all the cool stuff later on. Okay. This student here, Sharice, she's actually collecting spider poop. This was a study of heavy metal accumulation. We had a curiosity about spiders of the Bayona wetlands who live in a polluted environment. Normally, to do the heavy metal analysis, you have to kill the spider, which is fine if you get an answer. But maybe you'd like to understand the living spider instead of having to sacrifice it. So she wondered, was there evidence in the poop that might tell you about the metal contents of the spider's body? We found, in fact, that there were some markers in there, which means you can collect poop instead of killing the spider. That paper that we worked on came out in 2011. Okay. So, in case your students counting egg sacs, counting eggs in those green spider bags that we saw, here's Sophie identifying insects off her insect sampler, which she can tell you about kind of how long that took. Okay. Kind of cool. Okay. And then numbers. Scientific data results in numerical things. Lots of numerical things, right? People get really good at playing, you know, kind of the scientific version of accountant, tallying up things, transcribing data. They get really good at reading data off gels and stuff like that. They get really good at generating scientific graphics. I train them how to do publication quality graphics, <coughs> and they moan and groan. You know, it's <laughs> like error bars, all this kind of stuff. And I tell them, look, don't you know? The reviewers drive what we do. If we try to give them this wimpy graph, they're going to come back and you know do bad things to us, right? So it's like we got to have this wonderful going out the door. They get really good at that. Okay. 
And the other thing we do here is journal club. Now, what does this mean? It means you read scientific papers in your area. So depending on the project, we uh, round up appropriate scientific papers, read them relevant to the different projects going in the lab. Quite often, these journal club kind of things are a forum where students can practice presentations like Jasmine Takimoto is doing there. Notice all the yummy food. We don't do this all the time. So it's kind of a potluck kind of thing. And periodically along the way, there's milestones to celebrate, like Maddie's birthday there, which is kind of cool. Okay. And then conferences, taking your story on the road, just like a practicing scientist would do. So what does it look like to go to a conference? Well, this one is actually happening this Saturday. This happens every spring. It's a biology-only undergraduate conference. It happens somewhere in Southern California every year. Pretty nifty story. You can do podium presentations, which is sort of a PowerPoint thing, like Ning is doing here. Or you can do poster presentations in this way, where you have a four, four, 48 by 36 square inch poster space to park data and graphics. You stand here during these poster sessions, typically an hour and a half, and you interact with the audience as they come back and forth. Let's take a look at what this looks like to interact with your, your audience. So here's the conference in San Diego, the year that I photographed this thing. It's actually again there this year on Saturday, this coming Saturday. Here's the various posters up. The various students are sitting around the posters, and you have the audience members, faculty, other students, and things like that cycling around. People taking pictures, just like me, and stuff like that. Okay. Now, when this is going on, remember, you're expected to defend what is on there. Here's an audience member. Here's Jackie Salas uh, responding to this person. You're responsible for everything that's on that board. And you must interact with what's up there. You, you generated those graphics. You better know what they say and you know if there's issues with them and stuff like that. So, so unlike a podium presentation where it's 10 to 15 minutes long, you get some questions for three minutes here, the audience can grill you for 10 or 20 minutes if they want, one on one, which is why some people prefer these sorts of forums to basically podium talks. And if you do well, you have to remember that there's judges cycling through the audience at these things. You know, they're trying to be sort of under the radar screen here. They often carry pads and stuff, right? So be aware of people carrying pads. They'll go away and make notes about you. Because eventually they have to give awards. Here's Viviana getting an award at the Society of Advancement of Chicanos and Native Americans in Science. And here's Sophie getting an award as a second semester freshman, mind you, for the project that started fall of freshman year. That award she's holding got her to a conference in Puerto Rico a year later. All expenses paid. Pretty cool for a freshman, especially. Okay. This is the gold standard, though. The Spider Lab has always had as its goal to do this sort of thing, so what does it look like? Well, here's the latest one. This came out in March of last year. Remember, all the other names in any of these papers you've seen are all students. They're not professional, you know, practicing biologists. Okay. Here's the record. 16 papers since 95. 11 have been included in undergrad. The one was just published, as we said, last month. Those 10 older papers that have been out there for a while have been cited 104 times for over 10 sites of paper. So the 300 citations I've had, 103 have been in the past five years, and of those 300, over a third have been these student co-authored papers. Kind of cool. Okay. But the point is, why bother to do this? Because I'm trying to, remember, create this factory to produce people that diversify STEM. So what does it look like? What do they get at the end of doing this stuff? They get a lot of cool things. Honors. Sigma Xi is kind of the scientific version of Phi Beta Kappa. Okay. You know, there's, there's a key, you know, there's an oath and all this kind of stuff. Pretty nifty. Okay. Every other spider lab inducts a variety of people. All the students you see there from 2010 went on to graduate or professional school. This is graduate admissions, just some examples. This is three students out of the graduating class of 14 out of my lab, and I'll just uh, tell you where they went. Ania is at the University of Pittsburgh right now in grad school. Uh, Amanda there is at Georgia Tech. And Therese Blanche is, is a John Hopkins. You're just out of the class. And then we have full ride fellowship offers, which come our way quite often. Okay. Celia there actually has two masters, one in education, one in biology, and those are fully funded. She's on a full ride at UC Berkeley. Okay. Viviana there on the right had a full ride off at the University of Pennsylvania, and there's her twin Carmen, who went to the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. Sarah Karat here is at UC Davis in her second year, all in full ride. Spider Lab is a fun place. A lot of cool things go on here. And again, as you notice, the gender balance and stuff. Um, <laughs> I put this up with a group of people. We do have guys in the lab sometimes. Okay. Prior to Danny showing up in 2000, uh, whatever it was, uh, eight or nine, the lab was so solely female for seven years until Danny showed up. <coughs> and then he graduated 
Okay, we actually have a guy in the lab right now. Anytime a guy shows up in the lab, other people in the lab come to me kind of like their eyes get big and stuff. We have a guy? Where did this come from? Right? How did this happen? Right? Okay. And here's something else. There was actually a t-shirt which Sophie generated during the year that she, she was with us. And there it is. It's limited edition. Only a few left if anybody wants one here in my office. Okay. But the point is, the whole purpose of doing any of this stuff is really for this kind of thing. This is what I had in mind forever, was success and happy lives for these people. So let's talk about some examples. <coughs> Nora Espinosa here grew up in a small town in New Mexico. Okay. Okay. She went to grad school, met Rick Blob there. Okay. They now have two daughters. They're now both faculty members at Clemson University Department of Biology. <coughs> Wang Yi Chi here. I, I met her at Pomona College when the Spider Lab was running there. Okay, she went to graduate school at, at Columbia for her a master's in pu public health. She now works for a nonprofit in uh, New York State that deals with public health issues for underserved populations. Those are two her, her two girls. She met this financial services guy out there and romance blossomed and stuff like that. Okay. Abra Bolton here, she, I met her when I was at Bucknell. The Spider Lab was running there. She grew up in a little town in southeastern Ohio. Okay. I heard about this guy that she was dating, you know, it was on and off. What should I do? What should I do? Like, hey, you know, how good is this person, right? So eventually they <laughs> got together. He's now a vet. There's their kids. She's now a faculty member at Hood College, which is a liberal arts college north of D.C. She's also director of the environmental, environmental science program. So whenever I, I go out to D.C., if I have a rental car, I go up there to check on her kids. They're big athletes <laughs> and stuff like that. Ning Okambo on the top there. You saw her giving a podium talk in that picture I showed a while ago. At that conference, she met a tall guy, an LMU engineer. He's well over a foot taller than she is and anybody else in her family. In the bio van on the way back, there was like this buzz in the van about Ning met someone. Ooh, okay. That someone <laughs> is Scott. He graduated from engineering. They both moved to San Francisco because she went to UCSF med school. She's now doing her residency there. He now got a master's and he teaches the Jesuit high school in San Francisco. Okay. Sophia there in the middle, she's baby number one. She was at my desk last summer because they came to drop by. I met baby number two, who's John, the little brother. So I'm there at the table with Sophia. We're drawing spider pictures and stuff like that. And then her brother has this big explosion, the diaper leaks and everything. <laughs> Off they go down the hall. It's like, okay, deal with the disaster. But <laughs> the point is, as I said, one by one, my goal has been to diversify STEM, and this is how I've done it. So it's been a fun ride, and there's plenty more kind of to go. I hope so. Hope you've enjoyed that little spiel there. Thank you, Martin. You've been doing some really amazing work with our students here on campus. I salute you. Um, we're going to open up the floor for any questions that the audience might have for Martina. Do you work with black widows? I read in a book that they mate once and then the guy dies. That's how they got their name. Is that true? No. Well, okay. keep in mind, they're, they're black widows, there's actually a whole variety of widows in the world. Widows also have a system where males, it's, it's one of the most entertaining examples that I have. Male black widows have kind of like, it kind of looks like a slinky. <laughs> the embolus in a black widow is a big, long, slinky-like structure. Uh -huh. If you tease it out, it's like, oh my gosh, it's so <laughs> long. Okay. The thing about that, which is really cool, is that thing has to be wound around into the female's opening. Mm. So the point is, if you have seven cur, if you have seven circles to your slinky thing, you can only mate successfully with a female that also has seven roundy. Mm -hmm. So the way widows keep their species apart is if you try to go into a female who has fewer roundy things, you're left dangling out, right? If you go into a female that has too many roundy things, you don't get all the way to the end. So you're trying to wind this thing into the openings, right? So it's kind of cool. The thing about that is that roundy thing, after sex, it breaks off. Many, most, most widows that I know mate several times. So if you look at the bottom of them, you notice there are all these sort of slinky-like things hanging out <laughs> because each male has had his things break, break off. So in fact, for widow people that I know that study these things, they actually count the number of those things that are down there to get an idea of how many partners she's had. But the guy, does the guy live? It depends, oh, okay. because there's, there's all, widows, by the way, if you go to these animal behavior conferences where they study spiders, widows are a really big deal. One of the most extreme cases is the male basically dies when he's having sex, okay? 
And the, one of the paternity things that that species does is his dead body hanging there in the opening is a defense against having a, some other male come along. Because oh. you got this corpse stuck in the way. <laughs> it's like pretty bad. Another one of those widows has to basically have the female bite him. So he does this somersault thing. He has to have her scrunching his abdomen with her fangs. And at the same time, he's putting in his embolus structures into her openings. So it's suicidal sex, as they call it. So. <laughs> So as I said, I don't go to these sessions at spider meetings very often, but if you go in there, it's kind of like, whoa, what kind of kinky weirdness have they found, <laughs> have they found now? You know? It's like, you always find these things in journals. What are they finding next? Oh, my gosh. I, open it. Yeah, so. I, I also want to say yes. that the end of your presentation yes. was really Well, Absolutely. that's why I do what I do. Keep in mind, I've been in this business long enough to have seen faculty that I had here as an undergrad. I've gone to their memorial services and stuff. I've actually been part of the when I, the person I did work study for here at LMU, he was the last Jesuit biologist LMU had. He was a paleontologist. F as his work study student, I spent most Fridays listening to KUSC radio on Friday afternoons, and he was he studied little tiny fossils, mammals in in Africa. So he had box loads of of lake material, and it's my job to sort through this rubble, basically <coughs> looking for tiny teeth. It was really cool. So when I came back here, he was still here. He was retired, but he was basically dying at some point. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, I got to help sort out his stuff. And I, in fact, have rock hammers that he used for, for fossils that I now use for spiders digging out burrow, you know, burrow dwelling spiders and stuff. So, so the reason I bring up those things, is I think very much about legacy. You know, when I get freshmen as advisees and stuff, kind of during the four years that I have them, I try to encourage them try to have a career or a life choice that allows you to do things that make you happy and stuff like that, right? But I try to also remind them of the things that I've seen here. It's like, what do you want to be remembered for? You know, what kind of impact do you want to have had in the world? You know, this place has this business of obviously being men and women for others, the Jesuit nation ideal and stuff like that. For some folks, it's kind of not obvious. I'm going to be a lawyer. I'm going to be, how do I do this? Like, well, yeah, there's different ways to do that, right? But I try to encourage students, especially as they go to older, to think about that kind of stuff, you know, because that's kind of really all it's uh, all it's about. So my deal is my legacy is going to be these students who are out there in the world. So yeah. Yeah. we'll do a lot of good science along the way for sure, but it's really for this ulterior purpose why I do all these things. That kind of ties into a question that yes. I have for you, because I'm sure you are mentoring all of these students. So you're an LMU alum, so yes. who helped you along the way? And when did the whole spider thing first come into your life? Well, well, okay. Um, yeah, okay, so I was adopted at nine months, grew up in Pomona, okay, Pomona was a segregated city, my, both my mom and dad went as far as junior or what, high school, we grew up in the depression, there were 11 and 12 siblings on each side, so when you got old enough you went to work and stuff like that, okay. There were two major gangs in Pomona in my part of town, so I learned when I was a kid not to ride my bike through certain neighborhoods, you know, because it's like, not good, okay. <laughs> Out of my eighth grade class, people, some of them got incarcerated, you know, most people didn't go to college, some folks had kids out of wedlock, you know, so in other words, I always tell people, there was no guarantee I would ever do anything, right? My deal is, I've talked in other format, in other forums at LMU about the mentorship that I had. I have people that helped me along the way. One of them that I'll mention is Barbara Bussey, who's here at LMU. She was my high school public speaking coach. So Barbara started LMU in 69. She just had a retirement luncheon kind of thing a few weeks ago. But uh, I've known her since I was probably 13 or 14, right? So she's the one that really sort of trained me up on, you know, I was always talking about spiders because I thought they were cool and stuff, right? But she really gave me some skill sets in that whole area and stuff, okay? Howard Towner at LMU was another one of the mentors that I had because he was kind of an, an even keel, you know, really good at what he did, did quality research and things like that. Um, I mean, one of the sort of things that I sort of put out there for people is some folks that have PhDs tend to get this kind of ego thing that goes to their head, you know, kind of like, I have this great degree, look how awesome I am and stuff. So I was attracted to Howard because he was a very humble person, you know, and he was a really role model for me, sort of what being a professor could be like. So those are two of the people along the way. But in other words, that's really, and I'm also very stubborn. You know, I didn't buy the stuff like, oh, just because you're brown, you can't do this and stuff. It's like, huh, oh, you know, that I, I learned really quick when I was growing up to sort of figure out what was just 
fluff versus reality and what is someone just blowing bad stuff in your direction. So the point is having that growing up experience has really affected what I do with students. In other words, one of the things students get out of working with me is they gain confidence. Or they don't buy any of their nonsense kind of that they've had, had told to them. You know? So so the point is I don't want their road to be as hard as it was for me. You know, and that's kind of really sort of another thing that's fed into what I do here at LMU. Yes. Hi. Um, thank you for your talk, by the way. Yeah. Do you also do studies of on the spider wasp interactions and things like that? We do. In fact, I'll remember one of the challenges. There's a, I'll give you a story. Those trapdoor spider babies that you saw. Let me flip back and point out something here. It's somewhere in here. The species that we're looking at here, I'll give you an example of what is known or not known. Where is it? Oh, it's way back at point. It is right here. Those little babies are produced by a spider called Lothrus certum californica. That species has only one parasite on record, which is this black wasp that hunts them down. In the years that I've been collecting these things, we've found two other wasps, one that's metallic green, one that's metallic blue. We've also found a parasite that goes after one of the wasps. So when you dig up these burrows, if you find these cigar-shaped things hanging in the burrow, that tells you the wasps that... Basically, I tell people that we're doing CSI spider style, basically. Because you dig into these burrows and you find a crime scene, you know? <laughs> and, the, and the evidence, basically, is that you've got this big cigar-shaped thing. Okay, a wasp was here. Okay. So the point is, one of these that we dug out of the ground, you can actually rear these things. If the, if the wasp hasn't come out, you can actually bring them into the lab, hold on to them for several weeks, and eventually you get a wasp. We collected one of these from San Diego, and instead of, instead of getting a wasp out, the students came in one day and said, we've got all these flies zooming around the container. So somewhere along the way, the wasp attacked the spider. The little larva, and by the way, this the, the wasps live as an internal parasite, so they're eating you from the outside. I mean, from the ins. The, there's two versions. There's a parasite that goes after this thing, it attaches to your back and chows in you from the outside going inward, which is this one. There's another one that's more subtle that burrows into your interior and basically eats you from the from the inside out, which is a fly parasite. Okay. So the point is, for this wasp one, apparently either in the larva of the wasp because it's hanging on the spider's back, or in the cocoon itself, this fly shows up and apparently deposits its own egg into a little larvae thing or into the cocoon, the That's little tea. pupa, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, so in other words, they call that hyperparasitism in, e in ecology. In terms of species descriptions, the blue thing is unknown, the green thing is unknown, those fly things are unknown. Now keep in mind, there's probably people in the bug world that have seen these things, but they don't know what host they are. <coughs> so I know what host these things are, but I, it's a challenge for me to find people in the bug world, like, because we're kind of we're kind of like on Facebook, but we don't know we exist, you know? Because <laughs> in other words, I have the data that they need, and they have the identifications that I need, and trying to put two and two together is kind of a chore. There's very few people in the world that think about these things. You know, at all. <laughs> That's like the spider person. There was actually a guy in California who was the expert on these spider wasps that go after trapdoor spiders. He retired like five years ago, and then everybody's like, "Whoa, what do we do now? If we find one of these things, who's going to identify it?" You know, like it's a big problem. In other circumstances, I talk about the business of of some fields in science being glamorous and others being less glamorous. If you look at the past twenty or thirty years. You sort of notice that natural history oriented fields have gotten less love and less money and stuff like that, which means that a lot of museums allowed people of that sort to retire and they didn't replace them. Or if they replaced them, they replaced them with a more modern, cushy, cutting edge brand of science. You know? But a lot of this basic stuff is pretty important, especially as we go into the world of climate change, where all these relationships, in other words, a lot of these relationships, ecologically, of parasites to hosts and stuff like that, that's potentially food sources for other things we care about, like vertebrates and stuff. Some of these things have medical implications, because some of these guys are keeping down pests you don't want, because they're going to breed things that are going to attack people. When all those relationships get out of whack, who knows what sort of the downstream effects are for people. So the point is, a lot of the expertise that could figure out some of these things, we're letting these folks go away to retirement land. We're not sort of replacing them, which is 
but not a good idea. So I think is have my little piece of the action there. That's in other words, anytime we find parasite, we immediately save them and freeze them, whatever. Because we know that they're gonna be handy sometimes. So the question is now mind you, let me show you something else. Remember, as was mentioned, I'm director of the Office of Undergraduate Research. I brought a stack of these pamphlets here. Most students should probably know that we exist. You know, we do three programs a summer program for research, free housing, or cheap housing essentially, plus a <coughs> stipend. Okay, we do an academic year program, get paid for doing research, and we do the giant Columbia Symposium, which happens at the University Hall in the spring. Three or four hundred pre or students essentially present. So, okay, so again, I brought a stack of these. Please take them, right? Shameless plug for what our office does. <laughs> <laughs> over there, when you drop off your thing. And don't be shy. I'm here seven days a week. If you want to know more about anything, I live a half mile from LMU, correspond emails. I make house calls. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me give you an example. One of those students from Bucknell, who I didn't show here, I first met her because I was in my office at Bucknell and I got a phone call. Hi, who are you? Oh, I'm Wendy. Okay, why are you calling? Oh, because we're trapped in our room. Well, why is that? Oh, and they're on their beds, apparently. Oh, there's a spider between us and the door. <laughs> okay, so I got, you know, I, I got the directions where she was. I go in there, and indeed, they're both up on their beds, and there's a little spider thing parked on the floor, and they're freaked out. She was actually, she was actually also being treated for spider phobia. So in fact, she had to have EMTs come and take her out of her car one time because there was a spider in her rearview mirror, okay? You know, the one you have inside the car area. Apparently, when she was in her car, this thing dropped down, and she like freaked out and totally like <laughs> had an issue. Well, the point is, she came to work with me and worked for two years and stuff and things like that. So, in other words, when people talk about the business of phobias and stuff, by working with me, they realize that spiders are not the big, bad, crazy, terrible things they've been. Is it, if Wendy could manage to do that, <laughs> anybody can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, yeah. so, unless there are any more questions, I want to give Martina one more round of applause. Carol Raby, our event specialist, thank you, Carol, for all of your help tonight. Professor Michelle Lum, thank you very much for introducing tonight's speaker. And thanks to each and every one of you for attending tonight's event. There are still plenty of snacks and drinks available if you want to stay and, and talk and chat it up with, with uh, Martina or any, anybody else here. Um, and with that, I want to conclude.